good morning, everybody, and welcome to Elevate Aviation and our webinar. If you've seen the posters, you've seen that we have a new poster out now. Um, we first started this webinar during COVID to, as everything was getting canceled and everything that we were working on was canceled, our cross country tours, our learning centers, everything was getting canceled. And so um, we started a webinar series to keep the conversation going around aviation during COVID. And then uh, that went really well. So we started another six part series and we were doing that and we had uh, great feedback and everything was going really well. So we decided we we're gonna do this on a regular basis. So uh, we rebranded and so welcome to um, same thing, different poster, same time, same place. And uh, we're glad that you can be here with us. And if you're watching us later, not live, we're glad that you could, you could also join in and, and, uh, and watch and hear about our guest today. Because today, one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, and yes, I say that all the time, but I mean it this time. No, I always mean <laughs> um, But one of our, my favorite people, her name is Captain Melissa Haney. Um, Melissa is from Air Inuit and she's joining us today. And we have a special guest joining Melissa and I today. So Melissa is a Inuk pilot from Quebec. You may have heard of her. Uh, if you haven't, you may have seen her. Um, she works for Air Inuit and she's noted for being the first Inuk pilot to reach the rank of captain. In 2017, the Canadian 99s released a stamp that has Melissa's beautiful face on the stamp. I'm gonna show that to you guys a little later, which I'm sure is going to uh, just thrill Melissa. She's a very, very humble woman. Um, so Melissa spent her early years in the community of Inukjuak by Hudson Bay. And as a child, she loved to go and visit the airport. She told me that airplanes would come in and airplanes are an essential service up there. They bring in food, they take you to the dentist and medical appointments. Um, and so it's really an essential service. So she got to see those airplanes come in all the time. And to her, those airplanes represented something positive in her life. So in 2001, Melissa decided that she would become a flight attendant. So she was a flight attendant with Air Inuit. And while she was a flight attendant, she would look up, and I'm putting you know, words in her mouth right now, we'll hear it from her, but she would look up and say, hmm, why can't I fly the airplane? And lucky for her, from the story I recall, um, she had encouragement to do that. So now Melissa is a pilot. Um, but more than that, Melissa's paying it forward. Melissa is in charge of a program that Air Inuit runs called the Sparrow Program. And today we're gonna find out what that Sparrow Program is. And, uh, and we're also gonna meet a student of that program. Her name is Dorothy. And um, Dorothy, uh, I'm losing Dorothy's last name. Um, Dorothy, what's your last name? Andrew Ziak. Andrew Ziak, I know that. Had it written down somewhere, I lost it. Um, Dorothy, we're gonna meet Dorothy too. And uh, so we're gonna talk to Melissa a little bit, then we're gonna move on and, and uh, talk to Dorothy a little bit about the Sparrow program. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'll get Dorothy's last name right. And uh, here we go. So, hello ladies. How's it going? Good, you? Very good. Hello, Dorothy. It was so nice to meet you the other day, and I'm so glad that you could join us today. Glad you well. too. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited um, for all you, like for both, sorry, for both of you being here. Uh, we're going to start off, though, talking to Melissa a little bit. Um, so, Melissa, you and I have been friends for a little while now, mm -hmm. and uh, I am just so thrilled that I had the opportunity to meet you, and I'm so thrilled that you're on here so that other people that don't know you can have a chance to talk to you. Uh, first, let's, let's start talking about your younger years. Like, the fact that you're the first Inuk female to captain an aircraft is incredible. But like, what, let's talk about what brought you to that moment. So where were you born? And kind of give us a little, a little story of, of how you ended up becoming a flight attendant. Yeah, so I was born in uh, Montreal. My mom is from uh, Montreal. And my father, uh, like you said, is from Inuktuak, and you said it very well. <laughs> well, thank you. I didn't practice at all. <laughs> no, no. So my father's like two from years. <laughs> yeah, it just took that long. Um, 
He's from there. It's a, a fly-in community on the Hudson Bay. Uh, I think there are about 1,500 people that currently live there right now. So it's, uh, it's quite small. And uh, my mom uh, went up to, uh, she was a teacher. She went up uh, to, to start her career up there. And, and I was born in Montreal. And up until I was about eight years old, um, I was living up north. So we would travel between Montreal and up north a few times a year on, on the Twin Otters. And it was just something that I always remembered. I always loved going in the plane. Uh, whenever we had to go somewhere, if we had to go come down to Montreal, I just remembered having that feeling of, I really enjoyed being on the plane. So it was always something that kind of, I guess, stuck with me throughout my youth. And uh, when I was uh, in, started in grade two, we moved down to uh, the Eastern Township, so just uh, south of Montreal. And uh, I went to elementary school and uh, high school, uh, graduated high school um, in Cowansville, Quebec. And uh, after that, like, you know, your teachers tell you, you go to CGEP and you go to university. But it was just something that I did it because, but it wasn't, I never found something that I really loved. So I was kind of contemplating on what my next step would be. I remember sitting in in university class with like 300 other students and saying, you know, what am I doing here? What what do I want to do with my life? So um, we're very we're very blessed um, when you are a student from Nunavik. You actually get your any post secondary education paid for. So. Uh, we have, you know, these great gifts that, that were given to us. And we also have somebody to kind of guide you along. So I was talking with my counselor and she's saying, well, you know, Erin, you is looking for some flight attendants. Would that interest you? So I said, sure, I'll give, give that a try. Why not? And um, I started with Erin, as a flight attendant in 2001. And September 11th, 2001 was actually my first day solo as a flight attendant. So I had done all my training up until, up until then. And September 11th, 2001, as many people know, was, you know, a very horrific day in the aviation sector, in our industry and around the world. And for me, it was kind of an eye-opening experience as much as that might seem weird, but I just, we got stuck in, um, on our way up uh, the Hudson Coast, we got stuck in Kujarape. And I just remembered saying, wow, like this industry is really, really interesting. You never know what can happen. And it started being kind of a love affair then. And with Air Inuit, we're, you know, we're a small company and sometimes we had no passengers on board. So I was actually able to go up and sit with the pilots in the jump seat. We have a little seat up in front in the flight deck and you're actually able to go and sit with them. So that's when I, when I really fell in love with flying and saying, okay, I want to be up there. So I did it. <laughs> you know, um, the people who are in aviation, you know this as much as I know this, people say they are in love, right? They're in love with, with aviation. Just like you said, they fall in love with aviation. Um, before we get more into where we go with Air Inuit, um, I want to go back to when you were younger living up north. Can you mm -hmm. paint a little bit more of a picture of what that looked like so people really understand? You know, again, when I met you and I, I, I would ask you a lot of questions like, wow, like, like, what was it like up there? Like, can you, can you just kind of paint a little bit more of a picture on that? Yeah, so that's a question that, you know, we get asked often, you know, what Northern Quebec, what Northern Canada looks like to people living you know, as we call it down here, down south, um, we're not talking about Mexico, we're talking about, you know, Montreal and Toronto and places around here, but um, it's a really different environment. Um, all communities are fly in only and fly out. 
So we have one airstrip and it's the way in and out of the community. Um, it's all tundra, so it, there are no trees, lots of uh, rock, lots of snow in the winter, lots of wind. Um, surprisingly, in the summer can get very, very hot. I think a few summers ago, Kujarapik had one of the hottest places in all of Canada, so it can get very hot as well, surprisingly. Um, and it's just very beautiful. It's very, it's barren and um, wide open spaces and, you know, winters are, are long and dark, but in it, there's so much beauty. We have the Northern Lights. Uh, we have both bays. So we have the Hudson Bay and we have Dungava Bay. And it's just, it's just a really beautiful part of our country. Wow. Um, a lot. I can't wait to get up there one day. One of these days yeah. I'm going to get up there with you. <laughs> and so, and so when we talk about just to give people like a, like a really you know, just so they really understand, like you said that the airplane, they bring up the food, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and if you want to go to the doctor, you actually, that's, you have to get on the airplane and leave the community, right? Yeah. So Nunavik is home to about, um, I'll say 12,000. So 12,000 Inuit live there. Um, it's above the 55th parallel in Quebec. And there are 14 communities that line the Hudson Bay and Angaba Bay. And anything that gets in and out of the community is via plane. And throughout the summer, there are boats that bring up, you know, if you wanted a, to, a truck, well, the truck will come up on the boat, but you had to have planned it almost a year in advance to get up there. So um, if you ordered, you want strawberries that come out in June, well, you might get them, but it might be two weeks later. So it, it's very different. Um, there are small nursing stations in each community, but they might not all have a doctor. So we have two hospitals, on e one on each coast. And if something happens, you're going to be what's called medevacs. So you have a, a plane that will go to your community and fly in with, a, depending on what happened, with a doctor or a nurse, and we'll go pick up patient somewhere so it's kind of like or an ambulance at that time and then bring it to bring the patient to the hospital so it's it's a very different the plane is becomes a very essential service up there wow so fast forward a little bit again now and you're a flight attendant with air inuit what so and now you're looking up and you're like okay you get to sit in the jump seat you get to look at what the pilots are doing was that an easy transition for you? Was it a tough transition for you? And did, like, did you ever think you, you couldn't do that? Like a flight attendant was where you're, you're going to be forever in aviation? Or did you, you know, think automatically you're like, yeah, I'm going to do this? <laughs> I think I, I sort of don't remember. Maybe my mom could <laughs> attest to me more of kind of what I said. But I think I just said, I want to do that. Um, we're very lucky at Air Inuit, we get to talk to, you know, especially being a flight attendant, we talk with the pilots all the time. We're very, we're very close. And I think I just, you know, on my, on my pairings with pilots, I would go talk to them and everyone was very supportive of, of that decision. And they just said, go ahead and do it. Um, I, I maybe had some, you know, we all kind of have a little sometimes self-doubt in the back of our head, but it kind of outweighed the, my true passion. Yeah. You, you know, we talk about that a lot, that voice inside our head and, and yes. overcoming it. And that's something that's like one of my favorite topics is, is talking about that. So it's good to hear that uh, when you find your passion, it's stronger than that voice inside your head. And that sounds mm -hmm. like that's what you had. Um, one of the questions from our from one of the uh, people watching is, um, what do you remember about the first time that you sat in the jump seat? And that's for both of you, Dorothy. I don't know if you've sat in a. a well, we're gonna bring you in later, but this question is for both of you. Um, do you remember the first time that you sat in a jump seat? And Dorothy, if you did as well. I remember very vividly. Uh, I could almost tell you the date. Um, I did both on a twin otter and a dash. And um, at that point I had only been flying Cessnas and at that very new. 
at that. And uh, it was surreal for me to be next to pilots that I already had so much respect for that I kind of got to know up north and then to get to sit alongside them and them show me how things work that I thought I would never be able to wrap my head around. It seems so far removed. And then you think, well, like I could be doing that one day and not only could, but like will be doing that one day. Um, so you're on the moon. It's crazy. Like you just want to touch everything. You want to do everything. It's, it's amazing. Melissa, did you feel the same way? Yeah, I felt the same way. One of my, when I started, when I had applied at Air Nuit and I had an interview after that, they brought you what's called a, a fam flight. So if you're, you're going up and just seeing if it's something that you feel comfortable with. So you go into the, into the plane and just making sure it's, you know, at home for you. So I remember going up and the pilots had invited me up front and I remember them asking me like, you know, do you see the village? That's where we're landing. And me just being in like, awe that you know in this vast territory we're going into a community where there are 1500 people and the landing strip the airport is you know 3500 feet long and we're putting that plane they're putting that plane on there and yeah i remember that i remember that jump seat ride oh that's incredible that's incredible i remember the first time i went into the air traffic control center and it, it that was the feeling I had. Um, so it's, again, it's so nice when you can, when you find your passion like that, because I know a lot of people go through life and, and they're still, you know, searching for that moment of, of trying to find their passion. Um, what do you recommend to people? Melissa, what do you recommend to people who haven't found their passion yet? There's so many resources now. Um, I think just, you know, just having these webinars and hearing somebody like it can be just like, a click in your head um, and being like, oh yeah, like I think you were talking about the, um, I think it was with the uh, snowbirds. Yeah. One of the, one of the snowbirds, she just heard it on a, on a loudspeaker that there is a female snowbird pilot and it just clicked. So I think, you know, getting out there, being open to different things, finding out information, asking questions. I think that's, that's the that's the way to go yeah she said and and this was this really um for everyone but really for females she said that she the snowbird had heard mm -hmm. over the announcement they were they were saying the snowbird names and yep. one of them yep. was a female and as soon as she heard that female name she went oh oh i can do i can do this and then she did um yep. and uh, we'll have her on here eventually um, of course, we had to cancel her. She was going to be a couple weeks ago. We had to cancel her, and uh, we're thinking about the snowbirds a lot. And um, so, we have a question. Continuing with this, um, Perry has asked a question. Melissa, you met Perry yesterday. Yes. Um, the weather <laughs> up north can be crazy, good or bad. Combined with 24 hours of light in June and July to almost 24 hours of total darkness in December and January. How is a pilot you adjust to such extremes? Great question. Can you talk about the importance of IFR training versus VFR training in those extremes? Yes, that's a great question. Um, we do, at Air Inuit, we do a lot of training. Um, it's something that our training department, we're, we're, we work really hard to, to make sure our pilots are trained because the conditions are so extreme um sorry can you ask the question again um basically what can like can you talk about the importance of ifr training over vfr training in such extremes yeah so most of our especially well when i started flying um our ifr was with an ndb and we would use our weather radar to kind of get into these places um, so a lot, what, especially on the Twin Otter, that we are doing more VFR flights. Um, but with time and, you know, as equipment changed, we have RNAV approaches everywhere. So most of the time we are doing RNAV approaches and our minimums are just as low as if we're coming into Montreal or Toronto. So um, for us, our biggest challenge are crosswinds, um, runway conditions, 
And, you know, if we're like fog, snow, um, all of those things. But uh, for IFR and VFR, we're, we practice those all the time. Uh, whenever we do our, our training every six months, we're at the simulator or we're doing, uh, if you're on the smaller airplanes, you're doing uh, training every six months on them. And we, we do, you know, as the required approaches. So we do, we practice uh, quite often. Okay, I want to start bringing Dorothy into the picture here now. So let's talk about the Sparrow program. So now you're a pilot with Air Inuit. You made history. Uh, congratulations. Um, I'm actually, I'm going to use this opportunity right now just to share my screen for a second. Um, could you explain this? I, I said a little bit at the beginning, but can you, could you explain this, Melissa? <laughs> Sorry to <embarrass> yeah. you. <laughs> It's okay. So um, I was actually uh, commemorated on um, a postage stamp uh, with the 99s, uh, the Eastern uh, section of the Canadian 99s. Um, they have this program and it was actually the 10th anniversary of this program um, that they've been doing. And they select um, a female Canadian aviator that they that they just want to promote and just to kind of use to get um, their vision and uh, kind of the word that they want to spread to all of Canadians uh, around all of Canada and worldwide. So I was approached because the in 2015 was when I actually became a captain with Air Inuit. So um, it was kind of in the news and they, I was approached to see if I would want to uh, participate in their program. So that was in 2016. Well, you know what? If you can see it, you can be it, right? You can dream it. And that's, you know, young women that see that stamp, I want to be her, right? And that's what it's, that's what it's doing. I want to be you too, Melissa. Thank you. Maybe not that day. I think it was about minus 40 with the wind chill that day. And I had to take a picture and I think I had my parka. I dropped my parka for about two seconds and I told somebody to take my picture very fast so that we can get going again. But wow. it was very fun. You'd never know from looking at the picture. It's such a beautiful picture. <laughs> Thank so, you. so now you're a captain, uh, you're at Air Inuit. Tell us about this program, the Sparrow program. What, what is the Sparrow program? And there's a question here for you as well. I'll just, I'll just read it. And as you tell us about the Sparrow program, maybe think of the question too. It says, hi, Melissa. I am a parent of a fourth year air cadet in Yellowknife. Uh, I'd like to get information on your program. Usually um, my daughter, Haley, goes out to the cadet summer training camp every year. This year, due to COVID, all the training camps are shut down and everything else is. I'm wondering what your program offers for summer training. So maybe as you, as you tell us about your program, do you have any summer training as well? Okay. So the Sparrow program is a program that's um, initiated with Air Inuit and uh, Katavik Regional Government in Nunavik. So kind of tying into that question, unfortunately, um, you have to be Inuit beneficiary to be in this program. So as much as it's a great program, it's really um, geared towards Inuit who eventually want to come and fly for Air Inuit. So this program, I, I believe this is our seventh year, um, 2000, no, more than that, 2006, that um, it's been started and um, it's there for uh, Inuit beneficiaries who have completed high school and they want to come fly for Air Inuit one day. We're there to give them um, support on all levels. So we're there to, uh, we choose them, we give, um, have an interview with them and um, we're paying for, their, for them to get their license. So it, it's a really, really great program. Um, unfortunately for us this summer, it's postponed as well because of, because of COVID. Um, but usually we start the program in June, uh, around this time. I think you guys went up around the 12th of June last year, if I'm not mistaken, Dorothy? The 17th. The 17th. Uh, you're good at dates. <laughs> so, and what we do is, uh, we actually are, um, 
we're affiliated with a with a school uh, down here in uh, Montreal, and uh, there's an instructor that actually brings a Cessna 172 up to Kujuak uh, for the summer. So the students are actually able to start their flight training up north in their in their environment. So they're there for the summer with their own plane, their own instructor, and they start to get their uh, private pilot license. So for them, it just gives in kind of a little bit of a reassurance that, you know, you can start this, you're there in your hometown or in your home territory, and, you know, you're going to have all the support from all the different parties who are involved. So when, when Dorothy's group started last summer, it was, they had I think an amazing summer. So it just gives them kind of a, a foot up on, on all their training. Melissa, how important is that, that, you know, you go to them, that this training can happen in their communities. How important is that? It's very important. Um, it just gives them that extra little confidence that they might not have had if they started down here in Montreal, where you're having to get to, know a new city, um, a new area, how to get to and from your apartment to the airport. So it just gives them a base and the confidence that, you know, that they're able to, they're able to do this. And is there a mentorship program sort of tied into it or associated with it? Yeah. So with, um, well, I'm coordinator for the program and just kind of whenever they, if it's, oh, I don't know what to do because uh, I need to make an appointment for my medical. Well, we'll help them get set up for that. Or if it's a, you know, a question that's, or a concern that's more personal, we're able to be there for them as well. So it gives them support on, on all levels. Okay. Um, let's bring Dorothy in here. So uh, you met her earlier, um, Dorothy Andrzejak. How are you? <laughs> really good. Thanks for having me. Oh, and thank you again. Thank you for being here. So you're one of the students with this program. Um, so it sounds like an absolutely like chance of a lifetime. How do you view this? Like, are you obviously you're happy to be part of it, but maybe can you tell us a little bit? Can you start with your background, like where you came from, and and then to the point to what what made you decide to apply if you applied on this program? Yeah, um, it's uh, it's wild. It's been a ride. Um, I think for me, aviation um, was more introduced into my brain when I was about 13 and I was an army cadet and I kind of thought, oh, maybe I'd want to be an air cadet. Um, but even before that, as a kid, like spatial orientation and mathematical stuff and more hands-on things were always interesting to me. And I didn't put those things together until a bit later in my life. And uh, so I stayed an army cadet, never really switched over. But then um, near the end of high school, when I had to start applying to SAGEPs, I was very heavily looking into where I could do anything in aviation, because at that point, at 17-ish, I knew that that would make sense for me. Um, so when I started looking into it, um, my father at the time, he said that I could always become a pilot later. And and that I should pursue music for the time being because that was my other passion. And uh, so I did that. And after three years in college in Montreal, I still really wanted to be a pilot. And then it's like it fell onto my lap. My mom saw a posting on uh, Facebook and she forwarded it to me and it was the Sparrow program and it was a godsend, especially at the time. And I remember um, applying to the Sparrow program, but also at the same time applying to be a flight attendant similar uh, to Melissa, because in my mind, I thought, well, I just ha wanna have some way of getting in. And I remember this is March of a year ago, um, having my fingers crossed and thinking like, oh my gosh, I hope they take me for at least one of these things, like just so I can get a foot in the door and like, praying and hoping and talking with my mom and neighbors and being like, just send me good vibes. I like, I need, I need everything to like, just get into something, you know, get into one of those things and then work my way up. And then uh, not super long after I heard back 
uh, from the Sparrow program from Melissa saying um, that I would go through a medical and an interview and whatever. And I was exploding. I was so happy. <laughs> Not to mention how at the time I knew less than zero about how to fly, what a Cessna was, like anything. I knew nothing. And um, yeah, so then I, I went through the application process uh, with Sparrow people and, um, and got in and then moved up north for the summer, which was arguably the best time of my entire life. Um, you know, there's this beautiful land and you're not so many people so you can fly when you need to fly and you don't need to wait and you can learn at your own pace if that's fast or slow and you have an instructor with you all the time that you can ask him a million questions until he can't take it anymore and it's just it's so it's so perfect for someone starting out in something like this you know you you don't just go at this like steady pace you go at the pace that makes sense for you and you learn as much as you can constantly so it was it was amazing well wow. i think it's incredible that you were accepted into this program with zero <laughs> experience and it's great encouragement for other people who want to get into aviation want to be pilots but they don't they're not a pilot right now and they have no experience it's possible right yeah a hundred percent i think um even though I always kind of gravitated towards something like aviation, I wouldn't have gotten here if I didn't go through everything else before. Like I had to have those trial and errors. And for me, volunteer work helped a lot because no matter what you volunteer in, no matter what organization, there are so many different skill sets that you have to use, whether you have them yet or not. And I was a scout as well, like a Ukrainian scout, very gung ho. And then also army cadets. So both of those things kind of introduced me to so many different possibilities to the point where I was like, okay, well, these are the things I'm good at. And these are the things I like to do. And um, yeah, the things lined up. Wow. Melissa, one of the questions that we have is, um, are there other training opportunities like an AME other than pilot training with, the, with this program? Um, currently, no, but I know it's something that uh, we are looking into. Um, but again, COVID kind of has put a stop on it, but, um, we, it's something that we do want to do, uh, as well as, uh, for flight attendants, we're trying to kind of look at options where, cause what we, we've talked about it before, kind of the flight attendant is a, the gateway into, you know, opening your world. So Erin Newitt's always looking for, for, you know, Inuit to be working on at any position. Mm -hmm. Not just knew it though, right? Like at Air Inuit, if somebody wanted to apply, you can apply, right? Yep. Not for the Sparrow program, Not but, for the, but yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great question on here. Uh, Caleb is asking this. Um, it, it's not about the program per se, but I really like the question. Thank you uh, for this program today. I realize I know nothing about Air Inuit. Um, although I have heard of the airline, Googling Air Inuit, there's a list of destinations that you serve. Is there a city town on the list that you would recommend people visit? And if so, what would people see or experience there? That's great. Um, we ha it's, it's great to almost have a platform where we can, you know, promote this great part of our country because I always tell people like, everyone should go, every Canadian should go and visit the North because it's so beautiful. Um, of course, we all, like, I always have my, my favorite places to go and, and land, like when um, the winds are from the North and I get to smell the water and the salt water drifting off, drifting off from the, from the bay onto the land. I love landing runway 07 in Ibuibic. And when the winds are from the, from the east landing in Muya, because I know it's going to be bumpy, but I love that because I get to see the lovely fjord there. And I have, of course, I have a special place in my heart for Inukchuak. And I, I, everywhere in Nunavik is, is really beautiful. Um, if you choose any place, you'll, you'll love it. 
And depending on what you want to do, if you're somebody who doesn't mind the cold, because it does get cold um, up in northern Quebec, then go in the winter where you're going to see some amazing northern lights. But if you're somebody who loves to go camping and fishing, uh, you can go in June and July uh, in Kangasook. You can get some of the best Arctic char all around. So it kind of depends on, on what you want to do and see. Well, I'm wondering if everyone listening is thinking the same thing that I'm thinking right now, which is you are an incredible ambassador to Canada's North. You really are. Like, I just think it's incredible. You should be out there. You should be doing commercials, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Dorothy, back to the Sparrow program for just a moment. Um, what do you think would have happened if you didn't get into the Sparrow program? Like, what would you be doing now? Do you think you would become a pilot? I think that if I had heard back from the flight attendant um, people also with Air Inuit, I would have jumped on that opportunity. If I hadn't heard back from either, I would still have tried to figure out a way. I think I would have gone to military if I, if I had to, because it's sort of, it's hard to explain like how I was even so strongly drawn to something that I knew nothing about, but um, I, I would have done something to get to somewhere similar that I am right now. It, it's really like, it's like this force. It, it's hard to explain. Like the second you're in a plane, it's like everything vanishes and nothing else really matters because you have this one task that you're performing and it's more important than anything else. And so, uh, no, I would have, I would have run after that for a long time before ever quitting. <laughs> Well, Dorothy, we did surveys and focus groups and inter interviews about, about a year and a half ago now, all across Canada, trying to find out why more young women aren't looking at aviation as a career. Because uh, you know the stats, we all know the stats, it's, it's, they're pretty low for the women in aviation. And then I hear you and, and Melissa and so many other women that we know in aviation, and they are so passionate about it. They love it. So what's going on? Why do you think that more young women, women in general, but more young women that are coming out of school, why aren't they looking at aviation as a career? And what can we do? Like we're, we're doing a lot at Elevate and I know other organizations are doing things, but what's your recommendation for people to continue to do to try to get more women in aviation? Yeah, I think we're so conditioned to a lot of things, not just this. Um, but I think normalizing it and talking about it more is one of the main things we can do, I mean, trying to minimize those awkward conversations with people where they almost don't believe you when you say that you're studying to be a pilot or that you have your private pilot license, you know, or re really anything like that. You know, you talk to people and it's like, it's not even that they're not pro women in aviation. It's not that. It's like at the core, they might be, but they're so used to that not being normal that even that conversation with them, they'll go like, well, pilot of what? you know, and, and you're like, no, for real, like planes and, and just like making it more normal, less crazy, I think is good for everybody, not just women. I think it's good for both men and women if this just becomes normal. And when people aren't shocked or amazed when they're just like, oh, that's like a regular thing for a woman to do. I think, I think that's the best. So just to talk more, to spread more information about how you could do these things and how normal it should be. This is what normal should be, I think. Do you have an example, perhaps at a bank, of a story of an unusual conversation that you had? Yeah, so the other day, yeah. it's funny. Uh, the other day I was on the phone with uh, my credit card company trying to update information and they were asking me what school I go to and what I study and uh, I'm, I'm on the phone with like three different guys, they keep transferring me and each time I have to repeat myself, and I, I'm, first of all, I'm wondering, does this file not get transferred over when they, when they forward me? But anyway, so there, each conversation was, I felt like I was on repeat, and each time they go, well, where, why, how, you know, and, and you spell out the name of the school for them, and they look it up, and they go, oh yeah, that is a piloting school, and you go, that's what I said, <laughs> and it's almost, you know, I know they're not trying to be insulting, but um, I know that if you told them anything else, or if a guy told them, yeah, I'm at the school studying to be a pilot, 
they wouldn't bat an eye, you know, they wouldn't think twice about it. They would just type it in like normal, but they had to stop for a second and, and, you know, make sure that I was really saying what I was saying. And, um, in the beginning it was almost, it was pretty frustrating. I'm not like, I'm not going to lie. That was frustrating to go somewhere and you're just having a regular conversation with acquaintances and they, they have trouble like not pausing during that part of the conversation. And, and, you know, it's, uh, but it's, I'm, I'm getting there with being less frustrated and just informing people a bit more. Why do you think that that's frustrating for you? Like what, what part of that is, it makes you frustrated? I think, you know, you try not to take it personally, but it's, it comes across with this connotation of not only like, oh, women shouldn't be doing that, but how could a woman do that? Like, do you even have the skill set to do something like that? And it, it comes off like that each time, each conversation. It's like, well, how are you doing that if you're a woman? Like, you can't. You can't. And uh, it's frustrating to be almost, I don't want to say spoken down to, but talk to as if you weren't able to do the same thing as someone next to you who wasn't a girl, you know? And it, that, it's just that that's disappointing. It, it would be a lot better if someone thought, could be surprised and shocked and whatever, but not reply in a way that says, well, how do you manage to do that if you're a woman? Like, how do you even find the skill set for that? That's the part that's frustrating. I know there's a lot of people uh, that are listening and who will watch this later that can't believe those conversations still have today, it happened today, right? Like, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's almost unbelievable to think that those conversations still happen yet they do happen and I liked what you said a minute ago about you don't think anyone's particularly trying to be mean um they're just honestly surprised and yeah. so so perhaps one of the things we need to do is continue to educate adults about females in aviation would you agree with that like not just going to the kids and trying to educate the kids but but the parents and, and other adults you think that's important as well a hundred percent i think um as adults we kind of passively say things that we don't even realize condition other adults and kids to think a certain way or to have certain standards or expectations from different sexes races whatever and um we don't do it maliciously but it's the result is a negative one in the end. So even though we're not ill-intended, um, it has a negative effect on people trying to normalize that equity. I really like that. And, and trying to figure out how we, how we, I guess just showing more women in aviation will eventually, you know, make it, make it normal, mm -hmm. hopefully. hopefully. So you can go into the bank and so you're a female pilot and there's no questions. Melissa, do you ever get that? Do you ever still get that? Do you ever get questioned that you're a pilot? Yep. Still, still to this day, I was flying. I'm still flying. I was flying the yeah. other day. I stopped somewhere to pick up something and I was in my, my full uniform and the gentleman serving me was like, oh, you must work at the airport. And I said, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm there. And he's like, Oh, like you do check people in. And I said, No, I'm actually a pilot. And just his face was just like, Oh, my gosh, like, like Dorothy said, like on planes. Yes, I fly. And I think with like, I've come sometimes I'll just brush it off. But it, it does. And it would be nice to have, you know, one day to not put, you know, I'm a female pilot. I'm just a pilot, like, we don't need to to have the mm -hmm. we just no male female you're just a pilot and, and that's it i'm curious if anyone's watching live on facebook or here if you want to write in the chat at all what do you think about this like you know do you realize that this is still out there i don't know if, if people realize that that this kind of awe and shock is still happening um, there's a there's a comment here i just want to read this from perry he said i said last week which he did and I will say it again, the weather and the plane doesn't know or care if the pilot is male or female. So forget about what your friends or family or society has to say, follow your heart, go out and, uh, and your gut and go flying. 
uh, Perry, thank you yep. again for, for saying that. It's really nice to hear that. Um, moving, we have 15 minutes left. We, this hour goes by, as I always say, the hour goes by so fast. And I don't want to, I don't want to not talk about this next one. And there's a question from Rona who has is leading us into this perfectly. Um, so here's the question, Melissa, this one I'm going to direct at you because you are now our new ambassador for Quebec for Elevate Aviation. So Ambassador Haney, thank you so <laughs> much for doing that. Um, well. <laughs> here's the question. Would you be able to help with a contact mentor, a contact or mentor for her daughter here in Yellowknife to help get some exposure to aviation for the summer as she is finishing up grade 10 and interested in aviation? She is taking on an aviation course in school in the fall, but needs help in her direction on where to start. What do you say for that? Wow, that is, that is so great. Um, an aviation program in high school, like, oh my gosh, like, I, there's so many things out there now. When I was in high school, stuff like that didn't exist. So I think it's, it's great that these things are out there. And we do actually have some help for you. We have also an ambassador in, I think in Yellowknife as well. And I am sorry, I forgot her name right now, but you can contact Elevate Aviation and sign up for the mentorship program. And we will hook you up with a mentor in the area and you can ask questions away and get you set, um, set up with somebody to kind of guide you along the way. So it's, uh, it's a great program that, uh, that Elevate has uh, to pair you up with somebody for any questions that you might have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really do. At Elevate, we have a mentorship program. And uh, just to, to add on to, to what Melissa was saying, whether it is a pilot or an AME, um, if you want to be a flight attendant, uh, whatever it is in aviation, business aviation, the military, we have mentors that can help. And let's just talk about that for a moment. Um, Melissa and Dorothy, talk about mentorship and the importance of mentorship. Uh, have you had a, a, a particular mentor? Um, Melissa, do you want to start and then we'll go to Dorothy? Like, like and how does it change your life? And do you think mentorship really changes your life and how? Uh, for sure, mentorship. Mentorship matters uh, 100%. Uh, when I was starting, we do, at Air Inuit, we do actually have a lot of um, Inuit pilots that do, uh, that do fly for us. Uh, when I started and even up to now, we're about around 15% of all our pilots are actually Inuit. So with that, I think we all kind of help each other along depending where we are in our career and uh, what seat we're on and uh, what plane we're planning on going to next. We kind of help each other out. So when I started as a flight attendant, there were, there were uh, Inuit pilots who kind of helped me along the way. And throughout, you know, my whole career, it doesn't, ma it doesn't mean if you have a mentor that has to be in your exact field, it can be anybody who you, who you seek out that you can get some, some words of encouragement from. And um, that's kind of what, what I've used along my way. Um, yeah, for me, I mean, as I think it's pretty obvious, Melissa is my mentor. But um, on top of that, I mean, being up north this summer and meeting all these, I have to say, female pilots um, was huge for me because, like, Air Inuit specifically really makes sure that they have this good ratio between women and men. Um, and I, I know that's important for them, but seeing it in real life was a boost that you can't even explain like actually being around female pilots and talking to them and having that be just an everyday thing makes you so much more confident in yourself and also um knowing that melissa's on the other side of a phone if i need her like if i'm you know missing that bit of encouragement or boost at that day or whatever because we all get tired we're human you know you come back even from a flight sometimes and it does take a lot out of you sometimes you know you have it, it it's a real task and um, it makes the load easier just coming home and knowing that you have someone to lean on or to ask any questions or like have tell you that you're able to do it. Just knowing that that possibility is there already makes it less of a weight on you. Mm -hmm. 
Dorothy, I talk about that voice inside your head a lot. Melissa knows that. I even have a name for it. Um, do you have that? How is that? How does that affect you? Do you have that negative voice that tells you maybe it's not possible to do what you're doing? A very, very, very loud one. Mm -hmm. um, especially before I started the Sparrow program, it almost screamed at me all the time that, you know, you're not able to do it. I think the thing that helped me the most, and it's a lot easier said than done, is um, creating an environment for yourself and surrounding yourself by people who are supportive and understanding. Um, that turns the volume down of that voice by a lot. And it never fully goes away. There are definitely days you wake up and you're like, you know, I don't have it in me or I can't do this or whatever. But, um, but being surrounded by the people that you know have faith in you turns the volume down immensely. Yeah, it sure does. Eh? When you realize that you, you know, you not only surround yourself with good people, but get rid of the ones that are, that are pulling your energy. That's another huge part of that equation to help you mm -hmm. be successful. Um, just a couple comments uh, from people watching. I just want to say hi to uh, Brooke. She did the Explore Aviation Summer Camp last year in Cornwall. And she just wanted to say hi and thank you for these great learning opportunities. So thank you from, from her as well. Of course, the Explore Aviation Summer Camp is a, is a summer camp that um, NAV Canada puts on. And uh, I get to be there for those. So um, they're incredible. So there are good programs out there, like the NAV Canada Explore Aviation Summer Camp, like the Sparrow program. Um, do you guys know of any others off the top of your head? I know cadets is, is great for people looking. Into, like if you want to get your pilot license for free, and I don't know if people realize this, um, you can start in Air Cadets, right? Um, how old do you, what's the oldest you can be to get in there and still get your license at Air Cadets? Does anyone know? Off the top of my head, I don't. I'm not too sure. Um, I'm not too sure on the, the age as well. Um, I couldn't say, but you have to be a minimum to get your student pilot permit. And uh, it's around, I think that's 15 years old. May, it might go a little bit up higher to get up into your, to your private license, but uh, in, in the teenage years, I would say. Right. Someone actually just wrote 12 to 19. So, oh, okay. so huge encouragement to anyone out there that wants to get their, their license. That is a, a <laughs> very, very, very smart way to do it, right? Like go into cadets and, and get your license. Um, of course, if very you good. can't get into the Sparrow the pilots that Yeah, the pilots that we see go through that program have a very good uh, base and very good general knowledge to, to continue on to, the, on to the airlines after. So it's really great. Okay. Um, also, I just want to say hi to Trevor. Uh, he's uh, watching from Trinidad and Tobago. There are a few women pilots that have been listening uh, to what you're doing to promote aviation. So we say hi to them and, uh, and, and, and get into aviation, right? I mean, get into it. So yes. Speaking of me saying that comment right now, we're saying get into aviation. Our world is a little devastated right now because at the time that we're having this conversation, we're full on in COVID, um, hoping to come out of it pretty soon and start traveling again. How has COVID affected um, Dorothy? How has it affected you in the Sparrow program? And Melissa, how has it affected you at work? And um, Dorothy, do you want to start? Yeah, sure, I'll start. Um, it was very abrupt. I mean, I think everyone knows. Um, one day you're at school and the next day it's shut down mode. I was lucky enough to be able to stay with my family during that time and study for my written commercial exam coming up hopefully soon. Um, it got postponed because of coronavirus. I was supposed to do it in April and that couldn't happen. Um, but it's a blessing in disguise. I got to continue studying uh, from home. Uh, luckily for me, I didn't have a crazy amount of hours really left to do at that point in my training. So um, now I'm back at school, uh, not for classes, but for flying. So it definitely like set us back by a couple months, just as long as the mega quarantine was on. Um, but it doesn't change where I want to go. It just changes the timeline a bit. Melissa, how about you? Um, it changed as well. It was um, my role. I'm, I'm 
coordinator with Sparrows, but I also assist at the office now. I'm also assistant to the chief pilot on the Dash 8s. So um, for us, it was the same thing. I remember going home on a Friday and then we got an email saying kind of, don't come to work on Monday, stay home. Uh, you'll be working from home. So I've been working from home on, you know, different projects, keeping our operations going. So just that is a, is a challenge because I have two children. So they'll be, you know, hanging off of you when you're trying to do and get an email done or trying to get something done. And then also our flights have been affected uh, which is kind of it's sad we're still flying which it, we're very very grateful um, because we do offer you know we do we are an essential service to the to the Inuit of Nunavik so we we're still doing lots of cargo flights and I think our cargo flights have gone up drastically because everybody's ordering everything and uh, we still have medevac flights and we also do hospital flights for for people who are coming down for um, operations or if something happens so we still are flying but it's uh, reduced drastically so we're looking at hopefully getting getting back up but we just have to wait like everybody mm -hmm. well you know what that is uh we're just in a, we're in a crazy time right now. Um, we are just about out of time. So with that, I just want to say, because Melissa's on here, I want to mention uh, we are still gearing up for our cross-country tour next March. Uh, we are hoping that that's going to be um, with Elevate. We're hoping that we're going to be able to do that. We go to 20 locations all across Canada. Um, Melissa, can you just uh, give us a, a couple words on what that's like? Because people can see you in person and hear you speak in person. Um, do you want to just talk about the cross country tour for a moment? Yes. So the cross country tour, I would say, is a quick introduction, quick look into what aviation can have and different careers that you can have. Uh, we have speakers that are there from different walks of life, uh, different parts of the country and different careers that they have. And you're just there to hear their story about how they got there, what it, you need to get to, to that position and to ask questions. We're able to go into different facilities depending on which uh, city you're in. So you're actually able to go into uh, airplanes, into hangars, air traffic control centers, and really just to, to be with people who work in a field that you might want to get involved in so it's a really great way to get introduced to aviation okay final question melissa come on isn't air traffic control better than piloting no so right now you have two pilots and one air traffic I'm controller so you're <laughs> outnumbered so it's a great way we fight with each other all the time what's a better career piloting or air traffic control and we'll never know We'll, know, we'll, never, we'll never know yet. They're all, we always say if we're arguing over who has the best career, it's an incredible industry. Uh, I just want to say um, hello to Mary Ann Haney, who made a little comment on here. That's your mom. She's watching. That's my mom. She's so proud of you, and she says hello to you and to Dorothy. Um, Dorothy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, guys. This was really fun. Oh, yeah. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I forgot to ask you about uh, your bunk beds in the back, but Erin, you it does pay for your accommodations as well, correct? Yeah, yeah, it's a, a really great place. You guys should come over. Yeah, we're going to come over and have a visit. Melissa, I'm going on a tour with you of the north. We're going to we're going to arrange yeah. that. And the twelfth of yeah, we're going to go on some bunk beds. <laughs> yeah, we're going to do it. We can even film it and uh, and and showcase the north. A little bit more and, yeah. and however, however we can. Uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who is watching today. Thank you for everyone who's watching later. Uh, if you're on Facebook Live and watching, thank you for that as well. Uh, again, info at elevateaviation.ca is our, um, you can get a hold of us. Um, you can go into elevateaviation.ca, follow us on social media um, and learn more about what's going on. Uh, next week, we have an astronaut on. And we are going to speak with the first Indigenous astronaut to go into space. Uh, so that's going to be an incredible conversation. I can't wait to do that. And uh, I really look forward to it. And again, thank you guys so much. 
I hope that uh, this provided some inspiration and uh, my takeaway from it is let's be careful how we speak to, to women who are saying that they're pilots um, and try to show some more encouragement and not so much surprise. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll see you ladies both again, hopefully in the very near future. See you later. Bye. Okay, bye. 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 bye.